Hi everybody, my name is Doug Barr, and it's great to be back after a summer hiatus to welcome all of you to the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. The Forum is an educational nonprofit with a mission to inform, entertain, and inspire by presenting artistic performances and exchanges of creative and innovative thinking on a wide variety of humanities-based subjects. The Forum is an all-volunteer organization, and if you're interested in becoming a member, please visit shforum.com. Org. Today's topic leans into both art and culture. We're calling it Who Put the Funny in Feminism? It's going to be a roundtable conversation, something new for us, about the influence of television on the women's movement and American cultural shifts from the 1960s into the early 2000s. Today's guests are responsible for writing, directing, producing, and performing in some of the most iconic programs in television history. Joining in the conversation will be Bill Persky, known for writing such shows as The Dick Van Dyke Show, Sid Caesar, Kate and Alley, and the Marlo Thomas classic, That Girl. In addition, Bill directed 22 television pilots, of which 16 became network series, including Who's the Boss? He won five primetime Emmys and was nominated four additional times. Bill is a contributing writer to USA Today and the LA Times a guest lecturer at NYU Film School, Yale University, and Columbia University. And he's also a recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Writers Guild of America. Linda Bloodworth Thomason's camera isn't working today, but her sound is. And so fortunately, we will hear her voice as she tells us the stories of her work. Linda is a writer and a creator of Designing Women and Evening Shade, two of CBS television's most successful comedy series. She also served as executive producer, along with her husband, Harry Thomason, on three other series, Hearts of Fire, Women of the House, and Emerald. She wrote episodes for Paper Moon, Rhoda, and the original pilot for the series One Day at a Time, and five episodes of the series MASH. She joined Columbia Pictures Television in 1977 as an independent producer and is the first American writer in television history to write 35 consecutive episodes of a series. That's an impossibility, and she pulled it off. Linda has been nominated for five primetime Emmys and two Writers Guild Awards. Peter Bergman, the son of a naval officer, was born in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. After graduating from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, Bergman appeared in numerous regional theaters across the country in several national commercials before landing the role of Dr. Cliff Warner on the ABC daytime series, All My Children. After 10 years in that role, Peter left the show to join the cast of the CBS hit series, The Young and the Restless, in the starring role of Jack Abbott. Peter has also guest starred in the television series The Five Mrs. Buchanans, The Nanny, and The King of Queens, as well as made-for-television movies Pity the Poor Soldier, Woman on the Ledge, and Palomino. During his 43 years on television, Peter has won three Emmy Awards for Outstanding Lead Actor and been nominated 24 times. And to help us understand the impact of their work on the feminist movement in American culture and vice versa, we've asked Dr. Bonnie Dow to join in the conversation. Bonnie is a professor of communication studies and dean of academic affairs for the College of Arts and Science at Vanderbilt University. She's the author of Watching Women's Liberation, 1970 Feminism's Pivotal Year on the Network News, and Prime Time Feminism, Television, Media, Culture, and Women's Movement Since 1970. Bonnie is the co-editor of the Sage Handbook of Gender and Communication and of the Ant Loot Anthology of U.S. Women Writers. Dow's research interests include the rhetoric and representation of the first and second waves of feminism in the United States. Bonnie earned her BA from Baylor, uh, her MA from the University of Kansas, and her PhD from the University of Minnesota. We have a lot to talk about today and not nearly enough time, so if you give me just a minute, I'll join the others and we will get started. Thank you all for doing this. I very, very, very much appreciate it. I know how much trouble it was for all of you to get together today and talk about this subject. So uh, here we go. I want to start off today's uh, conversation uh, with a quote from our friend Bonnie here from her book, Primetime Feminism. 
And she said in the book, television programming is simultaneously a commodity, one, an art form, two, and an important ideological form for public discourse about social issues and social change. And Bonnie, I think you're 100% right about that, but I think we can go even further, to be honest with you. I think we could uh, go beyond discourse to, to broadening horizons and actually shaping audience uh, behavior. And I, I think that may be what's happened over these last many years during the period we're talking about through this. At the end, I'll ask you the same question and see what your opinion is on whether or not uh, television has or does continue to shape ideas in people's minds. Uh, Bonnie, could you do us a favor, um, being our resident expert on feminism and all things feminism as it relates to primetime television, would you define uh, uh, first wave fe feminism and second wave feminism in terms of the time period and most importantly, the goals of both? So um, first, first wave and second wave or second wave and third wave? A first wave and second wave. First wave and second wave. Okay. So the first wave of feminism is ge in, in the U.S. is generally dated from the mid-19th century to around 1920, right? And it is, it is very much um, distinguished by the fight for the right to vote, right? The women's suffrage movement, as we call it. So the demand that women vote, the political demand that women should be able to vote emerged in the mid-19th century. And then, of course, um, was finally guaranteed by the 19th Amendment that was ratified in 1920. So that's the first wave. It was very much about political rights um, and a kind of um, political equality. The second wave is generally, although people date it differently, it's generally believed to have begun in the early to mid-1960s had roots in the civil rights movement. Some of the women experienced sexism in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and so broke off to pursue their own goals. And it uh, continued through the 1960s and 1970s, and, and often is dated as ending in the early 1980s when the Equal Rights Amendment failed to be ratified. So it's a sort of like as something that puts a kind of coda on that movement. And the second wave was a, a really various movement. It had different, had lots of different factions in it. It was, of course, um, concerned with equality, but equality was defined in a lot of different ways by, um, by second wave feminists. There was, for instance, um, a, a large group and probably the most visible group publicly um, that was very interested in... Um, political and economic equality, right, things like, and was concerned with things like wage discrimination and employment discrimination, um, equal opportunity in education for women, um, and that was what, what typically uh, feminist theorists call liberal feminists, right, represented by organizations like the National Organization for Women. Then there were lots of radical feminist groups that were interested in as, as, the, as the moniker you know, indicates, much more radical change um, and change that would affect not just public life, right, like education or employment, but also private life, really, that would radically remake the way men and women related to each other and the kinds of power that women experienced in personal relationships. And so, for instance, that was the branch of the second wave that was concerned with issues like rape, sexual assault, right, which were which had been defined as really personal issues and not as political issues, and they really tried to make, to politicize those issues. So, um, so that's first wave versus second wave. Excellent. That's great. That's great. Okay, okay we're going we're gonna to jump right into the timeline, uh, and we're going to start with uh, Billy's show when he was working on the Dick Van, Dick Van Dyke show that you did 29 episodes. It's what I was able to find about it. I don't know if you remember or not. I wrote, I wouldn't wrote remember 29. That, and, and, uh, 29, it, and this it, was 1963 to 1966, right? Yeah, yeah. And, so uh, that being the case, how did you end up in that? Cause did that show start before 63? Was it, it already started, on the air when you started got? in 60? And it was almost canceled and then given an opportunity to have a better time slot and became one of the iconic television shows and comedy. And I think, though there was not an outright uh, feminist approach to it, I think there was in terms of the fact of the relationship that Carl Reiner had with his wife. 
and it was one of mutual respect. And on the Van Dyke Show, I, I sum it up is that for the first time, the husband and wife were equally afraid of one another. I mean, <laughs> he didn't want to do anything that she would get upset about, and she didn't want to do anything that he would get upset about. I mean, before that, you had Father Knows Best, which he didn't, but she'd be waiting at home in a perfect dress, high heels, and an apron, and everybody would be waiting with blood pouring out of somebody until he came home and told them what to do about it. But on the Van Dyke show, Carl and Estelle Reiner had a beautiful relationship and he believed in women's rights right you know before they were even an issue. And so that the writing always played into that they were equals and that they had to listen to and respect one another. And he also, we also got into racial uh, issues. Carl was very much an activist. And I think that the biggest, uh, the biggest thing there simply was that they were equally respectful and concerned about each other's being upset or angry. And they were also equally stupid at times, you know, they could, you know, there are countless moments of Dick just being an utter child in the face of her being an adult. Just to remind the audience, a younger audience may not have seen this show like we all did when in our youth. So just let me give a quick synopsis. The Dick Van Dyke Show is a show in which Dick Van Dyke, who's 96 now, I think, still around. Great actor. He came out of the theater. was a wonderful comedic actor, dancer, singer. Uh, he played the role of a comedy writer, uh, Rob Petrie, and his wife was Mary Tyler Moore, and she played the wife, Laura, uh, on the show. And Rob works with, he works, it's a show within a show. He worked on the Alan Brady show as a comedy writer with uh, Sally Rogers and Buddy Sorrell, who were played by Rosemarie, and Moore Amsterdam. And then the family lived in New Rochelle. All of these things are interestingly different than virtually anything that was going on. As Bill pointed out, Ozzie and Harriet, you, you never knew what Ozzie did for a living. The Cleavers, you didn't know what the father did for a living. It was, a, it was about the boys at the kitchen table with the mother who stayed home and cooked and the father who would then sort of play ball with them or whatever they were doing. So this was an enormous departure and it fits very well into the beginning of the, the second wave uh, of feminism because we're talking about the workplace, we're talking about a different dynamic for family, uh, including the fact that they, they lived in New Rochelle. This is a suburb of a major American city, so it's not generica like Ozzy and Harriet. We didn't know where they really lived. It was just generic. Uh, and so that changed that. It changed the dynamic of the, of the people bringing in a second family. Would you agree with all of this, uh, Bonnie? Jump in whenever you want to, but it expanded what the notion of a family was. That is the, the workmates and the family at home. And that was, a, it seemed to me to be a big step in the direction of, uh, of uh, women's equality in the workplace. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really true. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of small details about that show that are a real indication that it was a move forward for the depiction of relationships, as Bill said, or for the, you know, just the depiction of women. For instance, I mean, there is Rose Marie's character, right, who is a working woman who supports herself as part of the comedy writing team for, um, what is it, what is the name of that show again? The um, Alan Brady Show. Thank you, The, the Alan Brady Show. Yeah, The Alan Brady um, Show, yeah. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. But also, you know, Laura Petrie wears pants. In that, and, and, and no one had done that before, right? When she's at home With in their new- With a great deal of fighting from the network. They- Tell they, us about that, Billy, because I was gonna ask you about that question. She, well, she wears capris, she was- Excuse me, go ahead. They, 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 I know that they, there was conflict about that because she had given up her life as a dancer right. to be a housewife. So that was very anti-feminist. And at the same time, Rosemary, her, the gag, the running gag was she was after a man. She was after yeah. a man, always looking for a yeah. man. So that was anti-feminist. So it seemed that they did an incremental change from the Ozzie and Harriet into these, yeah, these but different roles they true. were playing. As much as that's true, their behavior was different. I mean, Rosie may have been interested in getting a guy, but she was a force unto herself, you know? And as I said, Mary was a force unto herself within the family. 
Right. Right, exactly right. The Capri pants were an issue, and the reason I was bringing yes. that up is because yes. she was that former dancer, but also because she looked great in that outfit, and, and apparently uh, the network thought that was a bit yeah, scandalous. It was, it Nonetheless, was, she was allowed to do it once in every episode, right, Billy? Yeah, well, more or less, you know, but she never wore an apron either, you know, yeah. to cover yeah. it up. And uh, that was customary costume for women in television before that. They always had an apron. Yeah, I, I I do. I think the things that I think the way that she dressed was it was important in terms of just showing a kind of freedom that she had. Because of course, you know, wearing high heels and long skirts, which is what you know everybody from um, you know Mrs. Cleaver to um, you know leave it to what is it leave, leave it, it to Beaver, Beaver and <laughs> for Daddy. Daddy. But yeah. anyway, these other these other um, wives had done on fifty sitcoms, and so it was an indication that she had been like liberated, you know, in some, in some key ways. I also think the other thing about Sally Rosemary's character is that she was an equal in that, you know, there were three writers there for that show. And obviously Rob was the head writer, but she held her own, you know, in those conversations, it wasn't like she was sort of the second string person or they didn't respect her opinion. And that was pretty impressive. And she too. Was, <laughs> she was based on Sylvia Fine who was the only woman writer on the Sid Caesar show. And she was considered an equal by, I mean, she didn't take a back seat to any of them. Bonnie, if I can interrupt, it was interesting what you said about Mary's Capri pants and, you know, what that meant, that the liberation of women uh, clothing wise that that represented. And you could take that trajectory all the way through her throwing her hat in the air on the Mary Tyler Moore show, which is something women had never been seen doing either. You know, in, in history, you will see men always throwing their hats in the air at athletic events and the war is over, but women didn't do that, but Mary did it. And it's kind was of it a pretty nice, uncommon. Nice victory. No, I'm done. Yeah, go ahead. Was it, Linda, was it pretty uncommon to be a woman in a, in a writing room at that stage, in the earlier stages in your career when you were writing for MASH and before that? Um, you know, I've never, this is so strange, I've never been in a writing room. I pretty much wrote my own scripts or assigned scripts. And on MASH, I was never in the writing room. Uh, Larry Gelbart just let us write our own scripts. And then he did the rewriting himself. But I know from my friends who've been in writing rooms, you know, it's still hard to hold your own in a writing room as a woman. If you see a writing staff going to lunch, even today, well, my husband used to point out a few years ago, one day we saw a staff going to lunch and there were six couples of young men going to the commissary and my husband said look at that darling it takes 12 of them to do what you do and <laughs> <laughs> i noticed that uh, uh there were no women on that staff but i know from my own you know experience with young women who've worked for me that it's still it's better but it's still very hard and they are almost always in the minority on every writing staff. You know, if they have 10 writers, maybe three will be women. I'm sure there are exceptions, but generally that is the case. Uh, I read a piece that said the Dick Van Dyke show was now considered a masterpiece that defined the sitcom genre from the 60s and beyond. Billy, when you were there working on that show, did you have a sense of how dramatically it was it had changed what it looked like and how it was going to change what followed that, including Absolutely. that girl and the many Absolutely. Episodes. I mean, it was the most golden and beautiful experience that anyone could ever had. And it, it was it, it was honest. There was no, you never try to write jokes. You wrote about human behavior. And uh, you had the most talented people in the world. And it was just... I would go someplace to a party or something, and I would just sit and wait till someone asked me what I did. And then the rest of the evening, no one else had anything to say. I mean, that's how highly regarded the show was. I mean, the first show that my partner Sam and I ever wrote was about them having the wrong baby. And that introduced an equal black couple. That was a war. But that, you know, all, all boats rise together. And, you know, the, the racial issue and the women's issue had a lot in common with one another. And they, they, they were happening at the same time. And, and Carl just wanted to take all those things on. And that's what made the show so exciting. 
it was, I've, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences, but never anything that surpassed that. Dick Van Dyke said exactly, practically the same thing, that he, when he was there, he was marveling at how wonderful the, everybody involved in it was, but what the product that was coming out of it was sensational. He quite and We didn't have a writer's room there. either. I mean, we never did that. We wrote the scripts, we assigned certain scripts, like Linda said, and we rewrote them. And uh, so it was a very tight knit family. It's fantastic. So, uh, unfortunately, time-wise, we're going to have to move on to another show. And the next one that we're going to jump to is you still, Billy, so don't go anyplace. Uh, that Girl with Marlo Thomas. It aired on ABC from 1966 to 1971. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis on this for the people in the audience who haven't seen this or don't know the show. Uh, it starred Marlo Thomas as an aspiring actress. Uh, Anne Marie was her name. Marie was her last name from Brewster, New York. Again, a suburb of the big city. So they're following in the footsteps of Dick Van Dyke with this. She sets her sights on the bright lights of the Big Apple and she meets and falls in love with the News View magazine. That's a People magazine kind of a, a for the show. Uh, writer, a fellow named Donald Holland, who was played by the late Ted Bessel. Uh, so that's the basis of that show. Um, Billy, can you tell us a little bit about how this came together, how that became a show for Marlo the Thomas? The basis of that show was Marlo Thomas. I mean, it never would have happened without her. The network had done a pilot with her and three other girls. They were airline stewardesses and the show that the pilot didn't do well, but Marlo, the people loved her. So they wanted to do a show with her. And, and so uh, Ed Sherrick, who was the head of ABC at the time, gave her a number of scripts and says, which of these do you want to do? And she was a nurse. She was a this, she was a that. She said, I don't want to do any of them. He said, well, what do you want to do? And he gave her, she gave him rather, a copy of Betty for Dan's book. He says, I want to do this. And they all had a meeting and they said, well, you can't do that. The world isn't ready for, for this. And she said, yes, it is. And I, I can do it. And then she, he said, who's going to write it? And she said, Bill Persky and Sam Denoff. And just based on the Van Dyke show, they trusted that. And and we did a show about a young woman who had a mind of her own and had a purpose of her own. And uh, to, to this day, women of a certain generation regard me as a hero of theirs, just because I was part of that, because it changed the thinking of teenage girls at the time. It really, it really opened their eyes to the fact that there was another possibility. And the most interesting thing, I think, in the end was the network insisted that on the final episode she and Donald get married and Marlo said then there will be no final episode because if that happens it makes a lie out of everything that I have wanted to do on the show and that was to give women an option to be their own person. So let me say a thing about this that's a fabulous just a, a wonderful distillation of what's powerful about that show. Um, this anecdote, which I didn't know, about Marlo Thomas saying that she wanted to do a show that was about Betty Friedan's book. The, the book that Bill means is, is The Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963 and sort of went off like a bomb um, in the U.S. Uh, in, and became this enormous bestseller. And it was Betty Friedan's analysis of what basically white suburban women found stultifying about their lives, right? It was about a very particular group of women who were well-educated, married, and then found themselves bored, frustrated, unfulfilled because their roles were so constraining, right? Because they were supposed to fill their days with like choosing the right toilet paper and, you know, overseeing their children and keeping their floors clean. And so, and, and really, uh, there was some really fascinating analysis in it about the ways that consumer culture was developing and daytime television, and you know, Peter can maybe talk about this, daytime television was developing to really reinforce those roles for women, right? That there was a lot of um, television programming that was oriented toward housewives, right? Women who were staying at home. So anyway, I can, I can see, so, so it was... 
what, what I think Marla Thomas probably meant was that that was a book that led to a lot of women rebelling against that role, right? Because of that book, women formed consciousness raising groups to talk to other women about how they felt about those constraints. Um, you know, some women went back to school, some women decided they wanted to go to work, which was in many ways, Betty Friedan's solution, right? With women need to have something to think about besides their home, their husband and their children. They need to have an independent goal in life. And she most often saw that as connected to them having some kind of paid employment. But, um, you know, it, it would be, Marlo Thomas was probably a little young to play a character that would be found in The Feminine Mystique, because that was really a book that appealed to a lot of women in their 30s and 40s. And Betty Friedan was about 40, I think, when she published it. Um, but what she took from it clearly was this idea that she wanted to be in a show that was about a woman who had a goal other than home, marriage, and family, right? Um, and it wasn't just waiting, right, filling time until those things came her way. It was, which had typically been the way that women had been, single women had been portrayed in television. It was, uh, it was also a woman for the first time who wasn't attached to someone. A right. father, a husband, uh, a hospital, whatever. Yeah, they hedged their bets on that, though, Bill, because her father showed up a lot, right? He came in from Brewster, oh, and they would have... Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, but that was, part of the, that was part of the independence, was to break that hold that a parent had on you. And it was the humor, right? Because yeah. he would come yeah. and try to boss her. He, he, he was would, the voice of yeah. the part of America that didn't understand that. What are you talking about, you know? The, the, the early skeptics of that show were obviously uh, proven wrong about uh, any doubts about Marlowe and being able to do this. Um, and when Marlowe was asked about it in an interview that I read, she said it was the reason that show worked was because there were millions of that girls in homes across America. We were not our mother's daughters. We were a whole new breed. Clearly, that's the case. And then, Billy, uh, you said, and if I can quote you, we threw a grenade into the bunker and cleared the way for Mary Richards to walk right through it. And then Mary Tyler Moore, who played Mary Richards, agreed, and she said, that girl paved the way for my show. So I'm going to use that as my transition into the next one we're going to talk about. And it's a quick little journey over to Korea. And we're going to talk to Linda a little bit about the time she spent writing for MASH. And then we're going to go to the Mary Tyler Moore show after that. So Linda, uh, let me just give a quick synopsis of MASH for anybody who didn't see MASH. How could it be that there's anybody on the planet that didn't see that many years that it was on and how brilliant it was? It was an irreverent black comedy following the exploits of a host of offbeat characters in a medical unit during the Korean War, including surgeons Hawkeye Pierce and Trapper John McIntyre, who create havoc with their martini parties and practical jokes while the war rages around them. Uh, Bonnie, you mentioned in your book that All in the Family and MASH drew themes from uh, 1960s radicalism, which by 1972 made it possible to make it comic. Uh, and the intended audience CBS hoped for would be younger, urban, and with greater disposable income. So, Linda, was that Democrat, demographic made clear to you when you were writing the episodes that you were writing for them? No, uh, not at all. No. I didn't know anything about the demographic. I had been teaching school in Watts, and I met an actress named Mary Kay Place, uh, the fabulous Mary Kay Place, who Bill knows well. Um, and she convinced me that, uh, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know what kind of writer. And uh, she convinced me that we should try it. And so we wrote a script for MASH. First, we wrote a spec script uh, for Mary Tyler Moore. And then we wrote a script for MASH. And uh, we had a meeting with Larry. Uh, actually, our three mentors were Larry Gilbart, uh, Jim Brooks, and Norman Lear. And, you know, that doesn't happen very often. And they were, all, they, were, they were all gentlemen and they were all wonderful to us. And, you know, we were just, we were kind of an exotic uh, um, pairing because, you know, we were happy cheerleaders from Tulsa, Oklahoma and the boot hill of Southern Missouri. We were not from New York. We were not from LA uh, and we were just different. And I think they kind of enjoyed that. And there weren't many women writers then. So no, that demographic was not made, but we weren't daunted by it. We had brothers, we had grown up in a world of, of boys and men, and um, we didn't know anything about war, but we knew a little bit about boys. 
So, you know, we said we would try it. Um, and we were very interested in uh, getting involved in the uh, estrogen side of MASH, which is what we did. <laughs> the, the, you know, Alan Alda was, uh, it was, it's been reported that he was a feminist, very much of a feminist, to the point that he was teased in some, some quarters as being a quiche eating women's liver. Uh, but he was very much a feminist, but in the earlier days of MASH, possibly didn't have the power to push things in that direction because it, it came from a feature film and it, the swamp was that. It was, it was, it was watching porn, porn films and drinking booze and all the things that you would expect from carousing guys. But then by the time you came in there and of the five shows that you wrote in 73, 74, 75, 76, you won two Emmy nominations, and one of them, I think, was for a, an amazing episode called Hot Lips and Empty Arms. Can you talk to us a little bit about Hot Lips, Houlihan, that, that episode, and how it is that that one ended up winning an Emmy, and how that changed the trajectory, I think, of that show, and, and fit perfectly well into our, what we're looking at, the second wave of feminism. I think MASH is still very dominated by, um, you know, testosterone. And it's still really, uh, but women love the show too. And they loved Alan and they loved his feminist sensibility in real life. And I think that sort of leaked over into the scripts. And, and Larry is such a sensitive guy, you know, that these guys are out there, you know, fighting a war. But the conversations were so much more sophisticated than you would expect. Um, and so, yeah, he wanted us to get involved with Loretta, and we did. And we just, you know, Hot Lips and Empty Arms was the first script that we attempted. And, um, of course, he rewrote it. And um, we needed him to rewrite it because we really didn't know what we were doing yet. Later on, I wrote The Nurses, where I was much more confident, you know, where Margaret really let her guard down and cried in front of the other nurses and said, you know, did you ever think that, you know, this might be hard for me and I might feel very alone here, you know, basically because no one liked her. Um, and we sort of delve into that, you know, that that being isolated side of things for women in the middle of war. But I think more than anything for me, it taught me as a writer and it, it really empowered me to go on um, and write about stronger women from having written about these men with more confidence increasingly because of Larry Galbart. I had wanted to be a columnist. And he really disavowed me of doing that. He said, darling, you uh, need to understand that more people are going to see your MASH episode, one MASH episode, than will ever read all the columns you write in your entire life. Never, ever give up this format. I know what you want to do for women, and you need to stay with television. This is the magic box that will get you there. And I think that was the greatest lesson that I got from anybody. So I would say MASH gave me the greatest kick in the pants, you know, that I needed to go forward. Incredibly astute on his part to suggest that. How big do you think the audiences were in those days for MASH or for Designing Women later on? How, how many people were watching those shows on a weekly basis? Well, I mean, MASH was what was the final episode? Like, I don't know, 80 million, 130, what, you, Bonnie, you would know. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, the share of the audience shares that those shows got were unbelievable. But, you know, it's also the case that there just weren't that many choices, right? You had the big three. That was, that's what you had, you know, in the 70s, which was part of the reason why there is this incredible cultural familiarity with shows from, from that era, right? Like All in the Family or in, like all the Lear shows, right? Yes, um, it's so powerful because today I yeah. feel like we're at a shopping mall in Dubai. You know, and 500 stores and nobody's going in the same store or having the same experience. You go to dinner and nobody's even, you know, uh, seen what you've seen on television. But then, you know, we really I mean, Bonnie's right. We were we were basically focused on these four networks and it was powerful. And I mean, the the um, the lessons that were going down so well with the medicine of humor, you know, were just being absorbed by the public, uh, I think even more so than in movies. You know, we had guests who's coming to dinner and film, but then when you saw The Cosby Show and when you saw All in the Family, that's when hearts and minds, you know, started changing. And, and again, because it was so focused, you know, in a very small place and everybody was looking at the same spot. I think it really did change America. And sometimes I think it changed America more than any legislation did. 
So I think it was I, great. I think, I think you're right about that. You know, the, the idea of inviting people into your living room week after week after week, and it's millions of people doing that. If you live in Iowa, you get to see what it's like to live in New Rochelle, just outside of New York City. You get to see how families are, can be, and you, you can experience what it could be like. So you get new opportunities for yourselves. I think it, it's enormously powerful, and I think what you all were doing uh, really helped, uh, really helped uh, move the needle, particularly in women's rights. Uh, Linda, to quote you, you are, you said in an article I read, uh, you called the Mary Tyler Moore Show the baseline for representations of working women. And so I'm going to use that as my segue into the next thing we're going to talk about, which is the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Um, did you ever work on that? Did you, you were a friend with, with James Brooks, I know. Did you work on that, Linda, at all? Did you write um, Mary we Tyler were, Yes, we did some shows around the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And, you know, we spent a lot of meetings with Jim Brooks. And, you know, he was another one that we just sat and learned from. You know, he was our Sherpa. Gotcha. Uh, Bonnie, I'm going to lean heavily on you for this because I know you've written a lot about this show and you know a lot about it. And, and none of the others here today have worked on that show. But let me give you the quick synopsis for those who haven't seen it. CBS 1970 to 1977. Mary Richards, played by Mary Tyler Moore, is a single woman who at age 30 moves to Minneapolis. On the heels of a broken engagement, she applies for a secretarial job at a television station, WJM, but the position is already taken. She's instead offered the post of an associate producer of the station, 6 o'clock news, Ed Asner, Ted Knight, Gavin McLeod, Betty White are all the co-stars on this. I suspect most people saw this uh, along the way at some point. Um, Bonnie, if you want to just start talking about it as an independent production company, how it was able to make money while others had to pander a little bit more to the uh, to the to the advertisers, and so because this was an independent production, they were able to make uh, money and be financially solvent on syndication rights, which allowed them to maybe have a little less pressure in what they were doing. Although they were still pretty sensitive to sensitive to the audience, and there's a story that I've been dying to tell because Bill Persky is here, so I will, I will do that in just a second. But I love that Linda said that it's the baseline for representations of working women because that is exactly right. And um, I think I I think somewhere in that book I call Mary Richards like sort of the archetype for the independent working woman, the independent white working woman. I mean, it's a very specific show in terms of um, its kind of racial. Uh, racial limits, but there is this story about how Mary Tyler Moore was actually interested in having Mary Richards be a divorcee, right? Mm, absolutely. Kind of in that moment, it's kind of old to not be married, and so she thought it would be more plausible if she was a divorcee, and the story went that there were some bigwigs at CBS who like put the kibosh on that idea and said, no, 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 people will believe that she has divorced Dick Van Dyke, Right that they would carry over this knowledge from her, you know, pretty iconic character on um, the Dick Van Dyke show and think, and that that would, you know, that that would, that would disappoint people so powerfully. That's that the whitewashed version. That's the whitewashed version of it. Oh, we, we want to hear the rest. They did oh. not think that there could be any feeling for a woman who got divorced. That was what that was about. They weren't ready it, for a woman to be divorced. And, and which is which was a really which was a real thing, and we would not like leap over that barrier successfully until Norman Lear's One Day at a Time in nineteen. I think it's nineteen seventy five. Well, um, actually, where, we did actually Kate and Alley in eighty eighty one, which also dealt with divorced women. Right, right. But the first one was this um, character of Anne Romano that was a Norman Lear production. Right. Who leaves her husband and moves to. Um, and moves to Indianapolis in what is actually a pretty decent dramatization of the ideas of the feminine mystique. So eventually what Marlo Thomas wanted to see did come to pass. You know, it just took like 10 more years. So um, so the Mary Tyler Moore Show um, actually, you know, my interpretation of it as, as, as Bill knows, is not, excuse me, as Doug knows, is that one of the things that made that show work was there's something for everybody. Right. There was this independent, you know, very, very pretty fashion forward, smart young woman for young girls like me to identify with and think, yes, there's a path for my life. Right. This is what I want to be. Um, at the same time, 
you know, she wasn't strident. She was very wet. She was sort of parented by Lou Grant in some ways. In other ways, she sort of functioned as Lou's office wife. You know, there was a work family, so she was kind of in this domestic setting, this quasi-domestic setting. So it was a kind of um, gentle depiction of an independent woman. And and I also have argued that, you know, this is sort of the first, you know, real feminist character on television because there's moments where she, you know, like actually has feminist goals in the show. She wants to hire a woman sportscaster. In another episode, it's evident that she's taking birth control pills. So there are very specific sort of like feminist ideas that emerge in the show, but they're not the major point of the show. Like, like there's no way that there's as much feminist discussion in that show as there is in, for instance, designing women, right? It's mostly about the lifestyle aspects that people really think of when they think of her as a, a feminist character. It was an interesting character because it was the character played on television as well as the Mary Tyler Moore in real life taking over an enormously powerful position in media while she was doing this show in which she played a woman finding her security enough, feeling secure enough to call the boss by his first name and never managed to do that so that she could remain appealing to both sides. Yet, if you look at her real life and what was going on in her real life, that had to be equally, if not much more inspirational to young women like yourself who were watching that show. Yeah, although she would tell you that actually Grant Tinker pulled, you know, uh, what was it called most of the shots, actually, on that show, that she did not sort of embrace a leadership role on that show as much as she might have. Um, she was going through an interesting period of sort of development herself, and of course they eventually would split. But um, she, uh, there's a lot of things I think that people don't know about leadership roles that Mary Tyler Moore eventually played because she became quite the activist around certain kinds of health issues. But um, in terms of her behind the scenes uh, Sort of leadership on the Rachel and Moore show, I, I, she's actually said that it wasn't what it could have been. Hmm. In in the real world, this was that it was uh, the period in which the angry feminist bra burning, all of that sort of stuff was going on in the real world, and yet uh, I read that there was a notion that um, feminists on television needed to remain feminine. And, and Mary Tyler Moore kind of fit within that spectrum because she was acceptable uh, to, kind of to everybody at the same time, uh, non-threatening in a sense. I think that's exactly right, yeah. And we took that lesson, those of us who came after Mary, I think, uh, you know, Diane English and I and some others, uh, I don't know that I consciously did it, but I'm kind of a benevolent, I've admitted to being a benevolent propagandist for my progressive nature and i definitely told the casting person who helped me with designing women go out and find the most beautiful women you can because they're going to be pissing a lot of men off and i want them to be good looking um you know i i mean i'm just a person who at the gay pride parade you know let's put the guys up front who are on their way to china to adopt a baby girl and not anybody who scares anybody and then we'll deal with all of that later at the big party when we win all our rights. But you know, while we're winning our rights, I think we have to be really smart and design programming that you know doesn't, I mean, we didn't try to threaten people on designing women, but we made sure everybody was attractive, everybody was winning, and everybody was making speeches that might have been considered obnoxious you know, to a lot of people. So I, I did, I mean, I consciously did that. And I think part of it was the lesson that I learned from Mary being so appealing and yet making so much progress. You know, I mean, she was inspiring all of us women to get in the game and she was bringing the men along with her. Um, and, and that was a good hat trick. She was incredibly likable, right? She was just so, so, and, and she was likable because she was very funny, right? She had great comic timing. She was self-deprecating. Um, and she often would in some way become the butt of the joke. That's another thing. Absolutely. that Always people. willing, always yeah. willing to be that with the shaky, quaky voice. Um, you know, and you might think that's a weird comparison because in steps Julia Sugarbaker, you know, who's just can verbally annihilate anybody. But then you see her with Hal Holbrook, you know, and she's got her legs wrapped around his legs while they're dancing. And, you know, she's the most feminine flower in the world. Um, so, I mean, it just, you know, just giving women more texture, more reason to be loved. 
And once you win them over, I found that they can pretty much say anything. I mean, why not? I took my dad and all of his lawyer brothers and gave them vasectomies and turned them into the designing women. Really, truthfully, you know, they were really based on those men. And so they, they've been through a lot of transitions, you know, all of those characters on that show. And I think you just, you know, you just take from what is in your life, the people who are in your life, you take what you need and then you make it into what can be winning with the public. And hopefully you come out on the other end, um, you know, victorious and, and you've made your points. Um, my, mine was about, you know, letting these women from the South say something smart because pretty much no woman had from the South, said anything smart on TV until then. So that think, was a big deal for me. I think one of the things that Linda really needs to get credit for, though, is that she put these four women together, right? So it was actually about a group of women, which is way more threatening than one woman surrounded by men. And, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore show was in some ways more progressive in its early years when she had this female community, right? She had Phyllis and Rhoda and, and to some extent, you know, with Sue Ann Nivens and um, what was Ted's wife's name? Georgette. And so she had this crowd of women that were kind of her female quasi-feminist community. And then she had this, you know, work family that was mostly men. The men had most of the power. Over time, after I think the first three seasons, like most of those women dropped away, partially because, you know, there was a Rhoda spinoff and there was a Phyllis spinoff. But Mary became much more defined by, like, her place in this world of men and, you know, the same thing, I, I naturally go from Mary Tyler Moore to Murphy Brown, you know, since Linda mentioned Diane English. And same thing was true for Murphy Brown. She didn't have really female friends. But then when you get to designing women, what you have is four women, right, sitting around talking to each other, which a lot of people would think was, like, too much, right, especially when they're talking about these really hot-button issues. Um, but there affection for each other, right? And the fact that they were this really tight knit group, um, to me, it was one of the most progressive elements of that show, right? I'm so glad to think that, Bonnie, because that was exactly what I wanted, because that is the way that I grew up. You know, nothing in my house was censored. My dad and all of his brothers and lawyer friends, you know, they would, they would just sit around and talk about literature and and religion and politics and nothing was off limits. And I heard every off color story, you know, that was going on in our town. They didn't, they didn't keep me out of it. And I love that. And so that was so easy for me to just transport, you know, over to women because my mother did not have those conversations with her friends, but I wanted her to. So that, that was the transition that happened. I just took their personalities and their boldness um, you know, in their conversations and, and transferred it to the women. And actually, when you have Southern women, it's pretty easy to do because Southern women are so outspoken. And I always wondered, why are these shows on TV, you know, these, these Dukes of Hazard and Green Acres and Beverly Hillbillies? I mean, this is so awful, you know? And all the women I knew in the South were just so interesting and compelling. And my God, you could write a novel about almost any woman in my town. And, um, you know, Although, that's a lot of there's a lot of people that think the South is redeemed by the Andy Griffith show. I'm just saying that. <laughs> we, we, we're going to have we're going to come back and revisit designing women in a, in a little while. But first, before we do that, because we're getting way behind the clock here, we're, we're going we're gonna to do that in just a few minutes here. Get more of the stories from designing women. But first, we need to go to Peter for a, a little look at. Uh, the soaps. Uh, Peter uh, was on a, a show called All My Children. It was ABC. Talk about your number of episodes. 10,712 episodes from 1970 to 2011, which uh, is about a fictional East Coast suburb, Pine Valley, and the show was on for uh, for decades. And it risks uh, took the risks that soaps took and talked about a woman named Erica Kane and her long line of husbands. But it took risks that soaps took with subject matter, and it was because the soaps were on. Uh, every day of the week, well not every day, but five days a week, and for years and years, and it hit all the social issues and all the social beats. Um, it started, you know, the concept of a soap, hence selling soap was on radio, where they were selling products to housewives who might be home midday. Uh, the, the audience demographic was very, very female, at least in the early days, and I, I suspect it changed some from time to time over the years. 
But the, the power of the soap operas is pretty extraordinary because soaps were the core network profit uh, from the mid-60s to the late 80s at least, by, uh, in, in which in 1984 they made $1.25 billion in ad sales. So they were terribly potent. So potent, in fact, that when they preempted the, the Olympics for nighttime shows, they, uh, I mean, sorry, they preempted nighttime shows for the Olympics. They didn't preempt soaps they, for the Olympics. They left the soaps on the air. They wanted the money and they wanted the storylines and people would rebel if their stories were cut off partway through. So um, among the many st subjects they talked about was uh, legal abortion on all my children and the storylines. I know some of this is before you were there, Peter, uh, but you were there for then 10 years after that, so you may have known this. They were talking about legal abortion on all my children one year before Roe versus Wade was passed. That's how long ago it was. So can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, about that and particularly the themes that you were dealing with from relationships, homosexual, drug abuse, all kinds of issues on that show and then on, on your next show that you went to after 10 years on that, you went to The Young and the Restless where you followed up even more stuff. Can you just tell us how that worked? So my, my arrival at All My Children in 1979, uh, the, the first thing I learned right away was these were shows created by women, written largely by women, for largely women, or largely for women, um, and, uh, and it was, as I listened to all of you talk about this, um, it was just a hotbed of ideas of how to, to make women stronger. Uh, by the time I was there, the happy housewife who was disappointed that the neighbor was so nosy was gone. By the time I was there, there was real stuff going on. As you said, Doug, um, the first Daytime Emmy Award was won by uh, uh, Mary Fickett, who had a long Broadway history, and on All My Children argued against the Vietnam War in 1971, really loudly, and uh, offended neighbors and offended others. And uh, yeah, she, she won her Emmy Award that way. This was not uh, a, a mom at home with an apron. This was, this was mom fighting for her son who had been drafted and was overseas. Um, you're right, Susan Lucci was the character that got the abortion. Um, it was a giant deal. And I think unlike so many of these stories that have been shared already, um, when the network was involved, it was women. Women at the network, all of the VPs of daytime television were women. And so, um, so things that might have, might have uh, run into to some, some, some difficult territory with men at the network, it wasn't even getting that far. The women at the network said, fine, good, we're in. And Still, let me let me ask you how. Uh, be, because sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but just uh, just let me just ask you how it is because as Bonnie mentioned in in that opening uh, comment that I quoted, commodifying part of television has to be paid for by commercials and selling soap is what soaps are. How is it that you were able to do those kinds of edgy programs on the soaps and not? have to hear it from not necessarily the networks who were interested in ratings, but more than other, but what they were, what was the, the advertising, uh, those people were the ones who wanted to do things, I would assume, that wouldn't get, make you lose the audience that you had already built up because it was too edgy. Did you run into that along the way? I think, I think they had a large enough audience that one, no one advertiser was going to stand in the way of a story. Um, uh, I wasn't in that part of, of things, but I know that they ran into a number of things, uh, interracial couple, uh, boy, they really struggled with that. They really struggled getting that through. Um, they were incredibly proud of themselves the first time a woman kissed a woman on the show because it hadn't been done in television. Um, but again, I, I think uh, if, if there was an advertiser that stepped out because of the numbers in, in those days, um, there was another advertiser that stepped in right behind them. Uh, so, yeah. so, go ahead. I think Peter's exactly right about that. And there's also just this kind of, there's also just a very strong difference between daytime and primetime, right? I mean, especially in the 70s and 80s, right? When, um, and so the, um, 
the strictures because of, you know, debates over the fam what was the family hour and, and that children you know, had access to television at night. Um, there was a much different level of um, caution around prime time, um, prime time issues that were or controversial issues being dealt with in prime time. In, in soaps, you could kind of like sneak it in because um, there was this perception that it was, you know, the children weren't watching it. It wasn't television made for family viewing. Although I just want to say, I was an ABC soap viewer. I watched all my children all through high school and college. So I saw Peter when he was on there and we were glued to it. I mean, we used to watch all my children in the, you know, in the cafeteria lounge, right? On this television, <laughs> like 30 kids sitting around watching all my children because it came on around lunchtime, at least in my market. And so that's when we, um, and so there was actually a broader, this notion that soaps were made for women, you know, sort of trapped at home. Actually, the, the, and they knew this, right? The audience was much broader than that by the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, and it was an audience that advertisers wanted, right? And so I think these showrunners, you know, gave them interesting material. Um, and our, I want to say one last thing about this, which is why there is this... Um, there's a, a long running uh, interpretation among television, academic television people like me, um, about what is progressive about soaps and why they are, in some sense, kind of a feminist television form, which you might not think, except, of course, for all the things Peter says about all the powerful women behind the scenes. And um, the argument goes that soaps take really, really seriously things that women take really seriously. Right, which is relationships and emotions and hurt feelings, and you know, right? They can make a whole episode out of like one unkind thing that someone says. So, because then like fifteen people get to react to it, right, in different scenes. <laughs> and so, um, and the argument is that that's a really that that kind of television, which was really about the way you know women think and feel, right, was progressive because it put that front and center. When, you know, at nighttime, in nighttime drama, right, this was daytime drama, and in nighttime drama, what you had, you know, um, a lot of the time until the 1970s was like stuff like The Untouchables, right, which was just pure violence, like driven by crime fighting, lots of guns, you know, stuff that was very much about masculinity. And, um, and that the soaps were sort of this refuge for women that, all, that took their stuff seriously. And and not just not just sort of their feelings, but also issues, like Peter said, like took seriously, like, you know, children and and me and abortion and right. birth control, so, stuff so like that. To to augment that, you know, a date rape story that on a, a powerful show like any of those listed earlier is an episode on all my children. It was two months of story. Two months of really exploring what women felt about date rape, and uh, and you you couldn't do it anywhere else. And again, you all mentioned earlier in people's living rooms, in 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 a comfortable place to sit and have peop women largely talk about uh, issues like date rape, uh, spousal abuse, um, a difficulty working in a men's environment. Um, uh, yeah, all of those kind of things were the fruit of daytime television. Yeah, After I think all my that's important. Can sorry, I just say real fast? But, yeah, I'll be real fast, but I just wanted to say what Bonnie just said and what Peter is saying. I think it's so important, and I congratulate you for recognizing Peter in this group because they do not, you know, it, Peter's, um, you know, uh, cohorts do not get enough credit for their legacy in all of this. I, I think Bonnie's exactly right. I mean, we were in my little town, we were glued to, you know, the same things they're talking about. Bob and Penny Hughes, were they going to die or live after a car wreck? You know, we're all running home to see. Um, but more than that, it's these, it's these undertow stories of the women and how long it went on. I don't even think that's ever been, I never even thought of that before. You know, how long, I mean, eight weeks talking about something like that how valuable can that be and what a role that played for women you know who were dealing with the same issues and you know i mean we're just sissies compared to these guys who do the soaps 
know, we really are. And we should bow when we meet them. But especially now that we know what a role they played. And I, I just hope this gets bigger and bigger for the people um, who own that legacy because they have not been recognized enough. Well, and, you yeah, know, I have to say that, sorry, go, go, go okay. ahead. Folks just had an enormous impact across the board though, because eventually like primetime television was picking up elements from daytime dramas, right? When we started to have serialized primetime dramas, which we really didn't have until the eighties, you know, like one of the first was um, Hill Street Blues, for instance, right? Peter Bochco really did take elements from soaps and say, yeah, let's put this into nighttime television. Let's have lots of continuing storylines. Let's have lots of emotional conversation among these characters. It was absolutely about trying to bring the things that were really appealing about daytime dramas to nighttime. Yeah, and it became safe. It was safe then because Peter and his guys had already broken the barrier, you know, so they could start stealing it using it at night, uh, but it's really, it's just amazing. Uh, I think this is one of the most important things that came out today, you know, is, is, is what a service that, and how long it's gone on, you know? Yeah. How long it's gone on, we'll really never be 12, able to me measure the 12,000 episodes it's been on, 12,000 episodes from 73 to 22 was The Young and the Restless, 10,000 episodes for the All My Children. Uh, and what's in, additionally interesting is that into third wave feminism, as we look at issues on the street, we're talking about violence against LGBTQ community. That's stuff that you're already doing in the soaps and you're barely seeing in, in nighttime unless it's on uh, a cable. And so it, it, it is fascinating what has been done with the soaps and how powerful they are in terms of changing what people think about and how they think about those things in, in our society. My sister, by the way, who's a psychiatric nurse, found out that I was doing this and she said, please say hi to Jack Abbott for me because all of the nurses are in love with you at her hospital. So there you go. Uh, Time-wise, sadly, we could go on and on with all of these, all of these uh, topics, but I want to jump to Billy again and go to Kate and Alley as sort of a next step in our timeline because uh, Kate and Alley broke fresh ground as a, as a, as a feminist narrative on mainstream television. Uh, it, it, it was an award-winning show, but it was two women living together, forming careers with children, uh, one forming a career, an active career, the other manning the house, and then learning how to, to get more self-respect while the other. I mean, this is an, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that moves ahead feminism during this period. Bill, can you talk a little well, bit about yeah, Kate and Alley and uh, how that all came down? Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to take up too much time because there's so much interesting other stuff. But the thing is, one of the things about situation comedies was it was an ingredient that the characters could not change. I mean, like I'm mean, happy days if, if Fonzie had lost a leg in a great op episode, next week he'd have the leg back because they needed the character to be that thing. It was a rhythm, it was a jazz band, and everybody had their time to play. But on Kate and Alley, the character of, that Jane played was a, a kind of pathetic housewife of a doctor who was cast aside, and over the course of the, of the five years that I did, she grew as a person and became an entity unto herself. And that was one of the things I think that, that Kate and Allie had to offer. And, and I think all of us have had this experience of a letter that tells you you're doing the right thing. And on Kate and Allie, I got a letter among many, but I kept this one from a woman who said, thank you. I am a single woman now who was cast aside for a younger, more attractive woman. I have no skills. And I want to thank you for letting me know that I'm not crazy and I'm not alone. And I, I think, I think, Linda, you've had those kind of experiences too of the of the fact that you not only reached an audience but you reached individual people who were affected by what you were doing. And Kate and Alley, for me, was about relationships and showing that relationships were about people, not necessarily a man or a woman. It was about mutual respect, mutual need, 
and affection. And it didn't matter whether it was two men, a woman and a man, two women. If those are the ingredients of a relationship and try to describe one that doesn't have to have those elements to it. So I think that what Kate and Allie, and I'll, I'll do a quick summary of what happened between, between uh, that girl with, I always said that girl and Kate and Allie were bookends with Mary Tyler Moore in the middle. And it was evidenced by the fact that on that girl, there was an episode where she was having a party and she was having a problem with her plumbing and she called her father. On Mary, she had a similar situation with a sink backing up or whatever it was, and she was very adult. She called a plumber. On Kate and Alley, the dishwasher wasn't working. They tried to fix it themselves. They flooded the apartment, called the plumber, and Kate had an, a relationship affair with him for 12 episodes. And that's in the course of 20 years, just the story of a backed up sink and how women grew and, or their experiences grew in just that experience. That's fantastic. That's a great story. And it shows the progression that exactly. these that, programs you know, had. We, we, really we're we're going to fix it. Those. We didn't. I'm calling a plumber. He's cute. And they had an affair. <laughs> and the reason they broke up was because he wanted children and she already had them. So that was the end of that, you know. In addition to the wonderful stories, uh, uh, Jane Curtin won two Emmys, and uh, St. James won, was nominated three times for Emmys as well. So the show was, a, was an amazing show, and, a, and it played a great role, uh, I think, in the lives of women in America. It really yeah. made a difference. Yeah. The, one quick question about the episode. I, was, I read that, and then we'll move on because we need to get to, we're a little bit late behind the, the clock here. Uh, but uh, originally, the network, were they concerned that they looked like they might be thought of as lesbians yes. living together, and they were yeah. trying to get around? That. And so, Bob, how did you get around that? Bob Randall, who was one of the most beautiful writers and people in the world and was gay, we wrote an episode called The Landlady, where it came out that this woman who owned the building found out that they were not a couple or a marriage, and she came in and said, You have to move or I'm raising the rent because, by law, a family has to be getting this rate. And so they went to look for another apartment, and they decided that they couldn't afford it so that they were going to be gay. And so when she came back in one of the most hilarious scenes of Jane's career, they were being gay, and she didn't know, she couldn't handle it. And as soon as they said that, the landlady went out the door and said, Marion, come down, I'd like you to meet these people. And it was about the fact that the landlady had a gay relationship and they became part of the family. And at the end, she discovered that they were just making believe they were gay and she was going to have them move out. And then Susan did this incredible speech. Bob won the Peabody for this script. And it was about who are you to decide what a family is? And he described what a family is. And there wasn't a dry eye on the stage or anywhere else. And that's how we got around setting it straight, that that was, that that was you know, the case. It's a shame we had to do it at all, but... If only we had a bottle of wine and two more hours, we could stick with more your, of these stories. Your wine. Which are fantastic. <laughs> Any wine but mine would be great, too. Um, so let's move ahead to Designing Women, where we were Yay. already touching, touching some ground in there uh, earlier. The synopsis for the Designing Women, for people who haven't seen it, hard to believe again. It's a sitcom that ran from 86 to 93 on CBS, focusing on the interior design partnership of four women. Sugar Baker is headquartered in the home of the senior partner, Julia Sugar Baker, played by Dixie Carter. Um, the show was uh, part of a lineup which uh, contained the uh, programming that the network judged uh, to be able to probably pull men away from, uh, from football. And so uh, in 86 and 87 and 88, Designing Women was part of a strategy by CBS that provided an alternative to Monday night football. Linda, did you know that? And did you think that was flattering or not flattering? <laughs> no, I, I never knew that. I never got into the weeds of that kind of stuff. Um, but that sounds right. 
Um, I don't know if it Mom, worked. You, we, we were we were jerking around a lot in the beginning, and you know uh, the the president of CBS got up at the upfronts and apologized for even showing designing women in New York, and he got booed because the press pretty well loved the pilot, and uh, we just we just got uniformly wonderful reviews. Um, but then they sort of buried it, um, and um, and it had a, it had a very shaky beginning. My mother was dying of uh, transfused AIDS and was diagnosed with it the day I found out Designing Women was going to be a series the same day. Um, and six weeks, six months later, she died. But I was writing all the scripts, you know, in her hospital room. And it, it was very precarious. And they were giving us different, different slots. And um, it was actually canceled. And um, I don't know if you remember that, Doug, but Harry uh, got with viewers for quality television. They had a big campaign. They saved the show. Bud Grant had become president of CBS then. And he went out and raised the white flag at CBS studios and said, we surrender Diane, uh, designing women's coming back. Um, and that was back. There was a lot more humanity back then and more personal dealings, you know, with shows. So it was saved. Um, and, um, you know, we'll be eternally grateful for that. The show, the show talked about... I was just ahead, sorry, I, talk, I directed a pilot that wasn't that, but became that later. Is that right? There was an original... I directed one of the shows for us, Bill. I, I was so inundated by then with my mom and the show. I, I honestly don't remember a lot that oh, went okay, on. okay, because I know I, I did a pilot for you. You very well, and you were wonderful, yes. No, but I, no, I don't even remember if it turned... I think it turned into Designing Women, but didn't start out that way. Oh, that was a different show. I don't know. I'll have to yeah. ask him about that. But yeah, we we were, you know, it was it was very shaky ground at the start. And also a lot of people, you know, were questioning like, OK, you know, what? Who are these women? You know, and they're so yucky and they never shut up. And, you know, they're just so loud. They have to be so loud. And we said, yes, they do. But it, there, it, you know, Bonnie, in your book, you say there's little that happens on designing women. Most episodes are driven by conversations rather than events. What emerges in many episodes is a variation of consciousness raising, a regeneration of feminist consciousness that often vigorously resist post-feminist attitudes. It, 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 the show ta is women talking about things that matter to women. P PMS, this is another quote, breast size, dating, divorce, men, all of that sort of freedom that they have within the confines of their workplace. And so it lets women listen to other women talking about those issues. And how did you ever sell this uh, uh, without writing the script? Did you write the script and then send it to the whoever you were talking to at the network, Linda? Or how did you Me? ever? No, no. I, I just was writing a pilot one day for, I'd been under contract to write a pilot for an actor at CBS. And I just looked out my window and, and started to cry and said, I just am not interested in this. And I'm tired of writing things that people are hiring me to write. So I just called the, the head of CBS Comedy and said, um, I would like to come over there and talk to you. I have an idea and I don't want to write what I'm writing right now. Can I come over? And he said, yes. And I came over and I said, look, I've got these four friends, which I didn't really have all as my friends. They were like half friends and half I knew about them. But Annie Potts, Jean Smart, Delta Burke and Dixie Carter. I said, all I want to do is get with these women and write for them. And I know it can be a hit show. I mean, I have so much I want to say and I know they want to say it. And so then he called the president of CBS down and there was no pilot. There was no storyline. I didn't even say they were designing women. And they said, let me get this straight. You're going to write it. You can get them to be in it. And I said, yes. And he said, well, then we will shoot that pilot. He said, what do they do for a living, by the way? He came back in the room. And I said, I don't know. And he said, we'll pick something. And I said, they're designers. And he said, great. And he left. And that was the easiest sale ever, you know. And it was just so uh, wonderful because after that, Jeff Sagansky and Howard Stringer came in and uh, Howard was the chairman, Jeff was the president, and they were really the key because they said every week, write what you want to write, write what you feel passionate about. We were never one script ahead. I had no writing staff. You know, I was just writing from my mother's hospital room then in Missouri. After she died, we had a plane picking up the script and flying it out here. You know, some amateur pilots who were landing in Tulsa and then bringing the script out because we couldn't get it here. But anyway, we uh, it, it was it was precarious. It was the way things were done, you know, way before television, probably in movies. Um, and we corrected all that after we got going. But I'll tell you, 
Um, it was wonderful to have that kind of support. Uh, Jeff Sagansky is a Republican. He encouraged me to do a whole show about Clarence Thomas, um, anything I wanted to write. I don't think it'll ever happen that way again. I really never had a note from the network. It's shocking. shocking. I mean, I had, I had, you know, busy notes, but I really never had a philosophical or political note from the network. They never asked me to take anything out. I know. Well, Jeff, Jeff is one of my dearest friends today, but, you know, he just had such confidence in these actresses. And for some reason, he had, you know, quite a bit of confidence in me. And it was working. You know, he just got such a kick out of it. And so did Howard. Howard, Howard traveled everywhere talking about the show. It was just kind of the the, you know, the new girl in town and she was different from the other girls a little bit. Um, and they just, they just went with it. And that was a lucky thing. I don't think it, anybody has quite had that experience of not being network noted. And I don't think that will happen again. I, I mentioned in your introduction, Linda, that you are the only person known on the planet to have written 35 consecutive episodes of a show for network television. I can remember you before a table read coming in with the script, passing it around, and it still was hot from the mimeograph machine. It was an amazing feat, and, and you, were, you were amazing to be able to do it. You mentioned yes, the, I said uh, something wrong, Doug. It was, it was film that we were sending to CBS. It was, I got the story mixed up, but, you know, we... We cut it so close because of my mom, and we never got ahead. We had, we had several uh, cars carrying the film of the show to the network to air, and it was to go up Mulholland. And if anybody went off of Mulholland and had a wreck, the other car was to move on. That's how close we were cutting it to when it would air. Uh, but we did get it together after the first half of the first season, you know, we did. But, I mean, it was exhilarating. And, you know, it was so lovely to see the women. When the men started coming on the show, the women started falling in love and marrying them. And you were there, Doug, for all of that. And there was just uh, romance was in the air. It was a very, very heady period. We were on the sound soundstage 26, you know, where Betty Davis filmed Jezebel and, Judy Garland, you know, did uh, Wizard of Oz. You know, there was just all this uh, spiritual, you know, ether behind us. And we just felt all of it. it. It was a very exhilarating period. And I don't know that the public and, and also the, the um, people caught on in the public, like Oprah and Catherine Hepburn, uh, Martina Navratilova. We even heard from Princess Di, who wanted to make her American television debut on Designing Women. And it just you know, it cut on in all areas of society, which shocked us. We hadn't planned for that. You know, we thought if we can just hang on here and do our little Southern show that's that's not Green Acres, you know, we'll be happy. But, but we got a better parade than that. The, the writing was so sensational that, that it's no wonder that those people wanted to be part of it, even if it was as a guest star. Uh, the third wave of feminism uh, began in 1993, and you mentioned Anita Hill, and, and that was with the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings. And in a conversation on the subject in one of your shows, Mary Jo, who was played by Annie Potts, of course, in fr her frustration boils over and she has this wonderful speech that I actually wrote down here because I think it, this, this is just very much, I won't, I, I'll do it no justice, but let me just read what, what Annie said. Uh, she was talking about that and she said, all we want, she says, is to be treated with equality and respect. Is that asking too much? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be strident and overbearing, but you know, nice just doesn't cut it anymore. I'm mad because we're 51% of the population and only 2% of the United States Senate. I'm mad because in the, the Seminole, Oklahoma police station, there's a poster of a naked woman that says, women make bad cops. I'm mad because in spite of the fact that we scrub America's floors, wash the dishes, have all the babies, and commit very little of the crime, still we only make 58 cents on the dollar. I don't know about the rest of you women out there, but I don't give a damn anymore if people think that I'm a feminist or a fruitcake. Terrific writing for you and all about what this conversation has been about, and I, I'm with uh, Annie Potts on that. Uh, sadly, we are completely out of time, and so I'm going to have to pull the plug with that, and um, let me just ask you one last thing uh, before that, which is what I referenced at the very beginning to ask your, your opinions, and I think it's pretty clear what your opinions are, um, about whether or not, uh, if you extrapolate those many, 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 many millions of people who have seen the shows you've all written, 
uh, and be, been involved in or acted on uh, over these many years, do you think that they really do me move the needle in the way people see the world and, and that television, even though it's comedy, even though it's television at night, even though it's never thought of as this is uh, great literature, it's, I think it, it should be and always should be thought of as something that really changes people's lives from little girls to big girls to young boys to grown men. Do you agree? Do you think your show's had a pretty big impact? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt. And I think some of it, some of it is great literature now, um, you know, especially on cable. Um, I, there's no question. I mean, Nick Kristoff has said, you know, you can say 50 million people, I mean, 50,000 people died today of famine and no one will care, but you will tell one story and people will get involved. And that's what we do. You know, we all tell our one story and then we go on to the next one story. And I know it's had enormous impact. I, I think I could travel through the United States uh, besides Cher, there's no one who could get more free meals than me for having young men, for having young men come up and say, I, you know, damn it, when Dixie Carter made that speech, I turned to my parents and said, I'm gay. Uh, so I feel like Designing Women, for one thing, brought more gay men out of the closet than, than anybody since Cher. Uh, and I know that we have had an impact on social justice, but, you know, we're just one of many. I mean, look at Bill Persky, look at Norman, look at all the shows, you know, all of the lives that have been changed and have taught us, you know, about our humanity and how, I mean, look what Archie Bunker did. We all learned that we could have a bigot in our family and still love him and still have a progressive, you know, life ourselves. We could move forward and change our hearts and minds and still not hate that person in our family. And, you know, that's what TV does. That You know, TV brings it all home, makes it personal, changes our minds and hearts so that you don't just have to boss people around with the walls. You have actually changed their internal moral structure, um, you know, in the best possible way. And I think that's what we all as, as writers and creators try to do at some level. Can Peter, I the, the, the quick story sorry, go ahead, Billy. Story. I'm sorry. Sure. I didn't mean you could. No, please uh, jump in. A therapist friend of mine said, I have to tell you a story. There's a woman who was coming to see me and she was divorced and her husband had married this young, beautiful woman and Thanksgiving was coming. And she spent four appointments of how she was going to handle Thanksgiving. What should she do? Should she go to his house with the kids? Should she have two separate Thanksgivings and so on and so on? And finally, the Thanksgiving, the, her appointment before Thanksgiving, he, she never brought it up. And he said, well, what did, apparently you decided what you're going to do in, about Thanksgiving. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do what Kate and Allie did. Just invite everybody and let them all go to hell, she said. So, Bill, as long as we got you there, your impact and the work you did, it's so very clear that it was impactful from all the shows you did, the, the many, many, many hundreds of hours of television you worked on as a director. It was certainly impactful in my life. You were my mentor for all of these years and my dear friend who gave me my first big gig. And, uh, and, and we and sold so the show and they my recast life, definitely. it. It was, sorry, what? We sold that show and they recast it. Oh, I know it is stunning, isn't it? Nonetheless, we both were able to move on from that disappointment. <laughs> Peter, what did you think about uh, the soaps? And do you think they, in fact, impact people's lives or do they just reflect on what's happening in society? You know, one of the great advantages for I haven't stopped working for 43 years. I have seen the changes. I have talked to the people. I have watched the show change. As, as it grows more and more sophisticated, more and more aware, more, uh, more articulate in the way it talks about women's issues uh, in, in just a couple of decades, the last couple of decades, it's been a marked change. Um, a, 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 young, a young woman deciding she wants to head the family company. Um, that's unthinkable, 20 years ago. And, and today it's a, 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 a big story on our show. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, not the scion of the, of the family fortune who, uh, who just like his dad did all, you know, raised, ran, ran the company. No, the daughter is running the company and the daughter is, is making ch choices for the family. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty powerful to see. 
Bonnie, you write about media and you write about feminism and uh, you're, you're, you write about in academia about what these people, all of us, who do for a living. How does this look from your perspective? Does, do you think that, in fact, uh, the, the power of media and television is, is truly impactful? And is it changing yeah. as we get to multiple platforms instead of just three platforms with millions? Well, I mean, the, the change isn't as broad anymore because we have such niche television now, right? But, but particular like pieces of television can be really, really important to particular communities. That's that's absolutely true. I just think it's more of a, um, it's it's they're they're just more based in more like specifically defined communities than they used to be when you would have, you know, eighty percent of America watching the same thing. So I, I do believe that television changes people's consciousness, right? It changes the way people think about their world. I mean, it's certainly, I've written two books about the ways that feminism was basically broadcast to women across America through both television, fictional television programming, which we've been talking about, but also um, television news programming. So um, I absolutely believe that. I think that the difficulty, I mean, the thing that people like me, that is academic television critics and scholars, the thing that we always warn against is don't think that what you see on television is what the world is like, right? So like the Cosby show, there was this huge argument about the Cosby show back in the day, about whether or not the Cosby show meant that there was no more racism, right? Because nobody on the Cosby show experienced racism, right? And people love the Cosby show, and so there were some people who argued, well, Bill Cosby is now the most beloved man in America. It can't be the case that America is racist. And that's, you know, that's worth talking about, right? I mean, it is absolutely the case that racism, you know, existed while the Cosby show was on and after the Cosby show was off. But did the Cosby show um, alter the way that, um, you know, some people who, who watched it thought about black families Sure, I'm sure it did, right? It's just, you. it's a very, very hard thing to quantify. You know, it's really hard to draw the causal line. Um, but I think that the evidence for uh, correlation is huge, right? That you change people's minds about contemporary issues when you do well-written television about them, especially, right, when it's funny. Because comedy is like this, you know, sandwich that you like you put the meat you know in the middle and hide it with the bread <laughs> just so that you can get you can smuggle ideas right into people's consciousness by wrapping them in something that's really enjoyable bonnie thank you thank you billy thank you linda thank you peter uh, this has been uh, really informative to me i've learned a lot from this and uh, hopefully people who are watching it have done the same um, if, to take your time today, all of you, uh, under the circumstances, it, it's just fantastic. So I applaud you all. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being part of this uh, forum. This was fun. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to all of you in the audience, wherever you may be in the world, for being with us today at the forum. If you'd like to learn more about the subject of today's presentation, you'll find related links on our website at shforum.org. I relied heavily for most of my questions on Dr. Dow's book, Primetime Feminism, Television, Media Culture, and the Women's Movement Since 1970. It was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, and you can find your own copy on Amazon.com. Billy Persky's memoir, My Life is a Situation Comedy, was published by Mandevilla Press, and you can also find that at Amazon. We have several new and exciting presentations in the works that'll air over the next several months, so please follow our website for exact days and times. I'll look forward to seeing all of you, I hope, at the next St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. As we say goodbye, we'd like to thank the following people for their generosity in making the St. Helena Forum and its continuing programs possible.